about technology, about many other things that I'm not going to tell you about here today. Now, I, I was around in the 1980s, but uh, I'm not going to show you any photos from the 1980s. I have to confess, when I see my colleagues showing those photos, it really, for me, it's really, really painful. <laughs> not, because of, not because of how we look now, but how we look then. <laughs> Begin with a uh, picture, a contemporary picture of Dick. It's a shame he's left. Well, there he is. <laughs> and, uh, when I saw this, this is a, a, a modern picture of Dick. When I looked at this picture, I thought, well, he's massive. Whatever you tell me, he can't possibly be 60. I mean, you look at it, he just doesn't look 60 until you see the rest of the picture, uh, and then you uh, realize that uh, he is wearing a name tag. That gives it away. He's at an age where he has to wear a name tag in case he forgets. <laughs> <laughs> right, now I actually met uh, Dick in Berkeley, 1981. Here's a picture of Berkeley. And if you wonder why he looks so weird, don't ask me. Ask Dick, he can tell you why. <laughs> That's a joke because we also know Dick very well. And uh, in fact, uh, the first big interaction I had with Dick happened here in uh, Aspen in the summer of 1982, when uh, we in fact uh, lived in the same house for uh, uh, several weeks. And I had a huge number of uh, recollections and discussions with Dick. And I remember one particular one where he was trying to explain to me transfer functions. Now, any of you who can't try Dick explaining something to you will know exactly what I mean. I <laughs> <laughs> figure out what the hell he was saying. And then he says to me, look, look at it this way. Right? It's very simple. Think of this, think of some of the rapidly moving neutrino-like particles, think about them as hot, and the other ones, the massive particles, as cold. And then he looks at this, that sounds rather good. Hot and cold dark matter. And I think that's, uh, although he doesn't agree with me, I think that's where the most cold dark matter uh, uh, came to be, the nomenclature. At any rate, uh, in his early days, uh, 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 Dick, as uh, George already indicated, I worked on neutrinos. That was an idea actually that came from uh, from the east, came from Zelovic, and uh, uh, I think uh, these were uh, Dick's uh, uh, famous uh, Soviet days. Uh, I think it was all due to the nefarious influence of Alex Sale, who I think was an agent. We all knew that. Uh, it was a uh, very strange company called the International. I don't know what it was. The International Bounty Merchants uh, (IBM) who used to work with them. And I think he was an infiltrator and uh, had Dick uh, on the wrong path for a long time. <laughs> and then uh, Dick, however, was put back into the right path in 1984 in Santa Barbara. Well, it's also been in Santa Barbara, and all that, that is one of the makers of capitalism, in fact, very there at the time. And uh, in 1984, we had a great time. There were many of us there at a workshop uh, where CDM was explored for the first time. And we spend a lot of time at the beach. And uh, unfortunately, it's too much light here. So maybe the people on the front row, if you don't make out a big bond of them, serve the waves. Uh, and we really did spend a lot of time uh, on the beach. And also a lot of time working really hard. And um, in fact, uh, it's quite interesting that these were some of the first papers in uh, CDM, not the first, I think the first were a few years earlier. but. The interesting thing is that with the exception of uh, Mark Davies and Simon White, who were much too respectable, uh, the rest of us, I think, probably including Jim, all lived in the same house, in the same apartment block. That was absolutely amazing. And uh, there were other people who were not in these two papers, who also shared that apartment building. Uh, there was uh, Neil Turok, and uh, I think you and Michael Reese stayed there for a while. Yeah, and uh, uh, Bernard Carlos Holt, of course, who, uh, as he said earlier, shared a uh, Partner with me, and uh, in fact, uh, I do remember Bernard, uh, it was great, with uh, metronomic precision every night at 11 30 p.m. He would sit in front of the television, turn it on, to watch a British program called The Avengers, and uh, <laughs> go with equal metronomic precision, and about 11 35 he would fall asleep. <laughs> Try to put him to bed. I would say that's an example of true love. <laughs> 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 we won't hear about this paper, the 
wonderful paper. It was written at the same time as the DAW paper in Santa Barbara. And uh, we were trying to rush to see who took longer to write these papers. And uh, this paper became a Bible. And uh, it, it really was truly a masterpiece. It's been translated into seven or eight languages. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I particularly, actually, the Europeans, the French, and the Spanish. Anybody who wanted to be anybody in cosmology had to be seen carrying a copy of BBKS. <laughs> they read it, but they had to carry it. Think <laughs> about those days of BBKS, in particular, the image that uh, I have that paper is neatly summarized here. <laughs> and, uh, not because the paper is indigestible, but because, look down there, it has not one, two, seven <laughs> Soviet days were, uh, uh, were numbered, and uh, it was clear already from the same simulations that uh, a, a neutrino universe uh, didn't look uh, nearly as good as a universe with cold dark matter, <coughs> one with a low value of omega. That was the CFA Wretched Survey, the biggest survey we had of the universe in the effects. And uh, the story of uh, cosmology to a large extent since then has been a story of developing this model uh, until uh, we find ourselves here today where uh, we have this lambda CBM model that agrees with a huge range of data and uh, over a uh, factor of a thousand or so, a of hundreds or hundred in scale. And of course, Dick has contributed enormously to uh, the state of cosmology today as summarized in this picture. However, I think we have to recognize that uh, wonderful as that the CDF is, uh, you, you have to buy that at the great expense, at the expense of dark energy with negative pressure, at uh, the expense of quantum fluctuation, ceiling uh, structure, and of course at the expense of assuming that there is some form of dark matter uh, and uh, possibly a uh, supersymmetric elementary particle. And I, I, every time I see how uh, young people in particular take CDM for granted, even though I worked on it all my life, I never cease to be amazed that, that we can all buy this when in reality all the evidence is circumstantial. I don't know what will happen with this. Uh, this perhaps testable, uh, for example, with Planck, uh, but it seems to me what's really within our grasp is to try to answer the question <coughs> whether or not uh, the dark matter is in fact called dark matter uh, and not something else. And that's what I want to talk about today, how we can actually test this uh, in, in fact, as it happens, our own backyard, the Milky Way. So I'm going to focus then on this part of the diagram, where as you can see, there's no data. That is where uh, the CDN model is still to be tested in a rigorous way against observations. Of course, uh, uh, there are various ways in which uh, galaxy will contribute to cosmology. Uh, the most obvious one is, of course, uh, that's when we look for dark matter, either uh, by direct or in the researches. But in fact, uh, I'm going to discuss now how we can actually test uh, the CDM uh, model uh, or theory by uh, looking at a number of properties of uh, our Milky Way, which are actually, in principle, uh, 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 amenable to study from observation. I'm going to talk first, uh, actually, before I talk about anything, I'm going to show you a movie of a uh, formation of halo. This is. Uh, movie uh, made by Volker Springle from something called the Aquarius Project, one of the Virgo Consortium uh, large simulation uh, projects. And what you see here is the formation of the dark, all dark matter galactic halo. Uh, and uh, I'm going to throw it too much light here. Uh, I don't know if you can see anything, but you can say you see the redshift. That's probably about as much as you're going to be able to see. But there's like a point where you switch off the lights. Uh, Ah, Monsieur Pichon, thank you. So there you go. So you can already see here at Redshift 22, uh, when the universe was very, very young, you can already see the beginning of an incipient uh, uh, sort of microcosmic web, uh, a number of the terms that uh, Dick has contributed to the subject. And you see here already a very, very high Redshift, that the universe was very, very high in structure, and uh, uh, these lumps uh, by this Redshift. Uh, masses of 10 to the 6 or so solar masses is where the first stars were formed, which would then go on to reanalyze uh, the universe. And uh, uh, you see now a very familiar uh, picture of accretion 
and uh, all the expansion through, and that is one that just went through here, there will be some more that go through the center. Uh, by this redshift, it's something it's already quite large, uh, mass about 10 to the 10 solar masses or so, and that here's something that's going to go through, and you see how it gets slightly uh, stripped. It's actually going to come back for more, it liked it, so it's coming back and gets zapped again, and it comes back again, and it eventually becomes smaller and smaller and smaller uh, until it's uh, just getting a small uh, uh, sort of uh, little core left. Uh, by redshift 2 or so, these objects are very tested with 12 solar masses or so, and uh, you can see that a lot of the actions over, uh, the center is more or less, or the central parts are more or less quiescent, they do get hit every so often, but uh, for the most part, uh, this object is now in a reasonably quiescent state where gas can then, without the momentum, can then pull and agree to form this light rather than the way. And actually, I think the movie now gets a bit boring. Uh, so we see it showing, if you put the light back on, I would appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I will go thanks to stuff. So, I'd say there's three ways in which we can use uh, the Milky Way uh, to test the CDN paradigm. The first one is the structure of gold like halos. And we know for a long time now from simulations that uh, uh, one of the predictions, uh, I think, uh, uh, on the spiritual predictions of CDN is that the density profiles of dark matter halos should be cuspy. They have this uh, in a W profile where uh, the density diverges uh, like uh, one with R or so uh, towards the center. So we know that for a long time. So it's called the NW profile. And then George already showed what the NW profile looked like. Uh, Predictable study. That's the picture of uh, uh, the profile that I mentioned. And um, <laughs> <laughs> we can study now this uh, uh, structure with much greater resolution with simulations like the one I just showed you. So in this Aquarius program, uh, we've simulated there's no intermediate state between darkness and light, is it? No. Right. So, uh, we see, we see that's, that's probably the most profound thing I would have said. Uh, that we simulated uh, uh, six, thank you, we this stuff. So there's six uh, angles here that uh, we simulated. The high resolution case has 1.4 billion particles, each of mass, 1,000 solar masses. This is the second level of resolution for the particle mass. It's about 10,000 solar masses. And so this really allows us to look in great detail not only at the structure of the main halo, which is not the main focus today, but in fact at the structure of the sub halos, which is where we're going to focus. Uh, but here is a, a picture of uh, uh, the NFW profile. Uh, the original NFW work stopped here uh, at uh, a, a radio distance of about 10 kiloparsecs or so, where uh, beyond where the disk of the galaxy is. But it turns out that now with this much higher resolution point, allows the tens of parsecs uh, that simple thing <coughs> uh, still seems to work. I think uh, we either just got very lucky or Simon is very bright. Uh, <coughs> so now the question then is uh, the simulations give cost the profiles and the issue really is does nature actually do the same as the simulations? And that uh, many people try and answer this question uh, looking at galaxies and clusters. That's reasonable but it's dangerous because uh, the halos <coughs> of uh, galaxies and clusters are likely not the lot of variants in the center, they're likely to be modified by the galaxy forming in them. But this is one of the rare occasions where nature has been kind to us and has given us objects which, in fact, may retain pristine dark matter halos. And these are the dwarf galaxies uh, of the Milky Way, not just the spheroidals, the dwarf satellites of the Milky Way. And these are objects that have enormous mass and light ratios, about a thousand or so, they're completely dark dominated. And so perhaps here, binary effects are very important, and we might be actually be able to see the uh, pristine dark matter halo. So the question then is, uh, do these satellites of the Milky Way live in uh, halos with uh, uh, cosmic profiles? Now, in fact, uh, uh, there are a uh, question that cannot be easily answered because uh, for six of these uh, uh, dual galaxies, there are now very good photometric and spectroscopic data in particular uh, that allows one to study the motions of the stars, in particular in these uh, uh, six galaxies here. In Fornax, for example, although you can to see where Fornax is, but it's somewhere in there, there are now uh, velocities measured for several thousand, two or three thousand stars. Uh, and also very large stars for these other dwarfs. And so 
uh, we can then, uh, as a question, uh, do these uh, uh, data, are they consistent with the idea that the satellites form in CD and Halo? So we resort to page one uh, of uh, uh, Pini and Germain, and we have to go back to uh, the same as Gene's equation. Uh, that is basic tool to try and uh, answer this question. Uh, this is the first go of the question. So the Pini's equation, of course, uh, relates to the potential, uh, which we measure in the Aquarius simulation, to the observed stellar density profile, uh, and the observed radio loss expression. And uh, there is this annoying velocity uh, isotropy, which is difficult to measure. And I'm going to show you actually uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, for a while is the case in which the velocity and isotropy is the simplest possible value to have zero. So I'm going to be talking about isotropic models. And I'll show you that that's not crazy. So here's the program. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, pick uh, one of the subhalos in the Aquarius simulation. And let's imagine that a galaxy with the observed a stellar density profile, say a fornax, has formed in a particular subhalo. Let's assume that. And then, uh, because we know the potential and uh, we've assumed the stellar surface density profile, we can then predict, if that was true, what the run of loss of dispersion with radius should be for that particular halo. Uh, we measure that, so we compare the prediction with the measurement, and that gives you a value of time squared. Uh, and then um, record that, and then you move to the next subhalo and do the same thing. Suppose four nights are forming that subhalo, I mean, so uh, eventually you find the best of uh, these uh, subhalo, the best uh, fit for four nights. And you do that for the other orbits. So that is the program, and that is a paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, by uh, Strigari, uh, Simon, and myself. So the first thing you need to know is what is the, uh, 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 the uh, Gene's equation has a 3D stellar density profile, so you need to guess what that is. Uh, you only observe the projected density profile. Actually, it's important to have a formula, a fitting formula, that's sufficiently general. Many people, well, several people, have attempted this kind of uh, analysis, and uh, often they get the wrong answer because they don't have sufficiently uh, uh, general forms for the 3D stellar velocity distribution. So, uh, I won't say more about that, but uh, that's mostly for the benefit of a uh, few of the experts in the audience. So here's the result of that program then. We've got uh, taken the potential from the simulations. Uh, we've uh, uh, inferred these from the metric data, taken the voltage like sort of to be zero, uh, and found uh, the halo, predicted that, and then found the halo that gives the best fit uh, to the data. And here are the results. So plotted here is the velocity dispersion. Structure of radios, the Fornax, Leo, Carina, Sculptor, and uh, Sextance, and the data, uh, set data, shown by the symbols, and the red lines are the best fits. And you can see by eye that these fits are extremely good. Uh, you can quantify that, and, uh, and you can see that uh, this is the uh, probability that the best fit can be rejected. These numbers are all remarkable, showing that we have found at least at the level of the Gene's equation, payloads that are perfectly consistent with what we know. They can go further than that, and uh, as the, uh, the Gene's equation is just a second moment equation, but of course with thousands of measurements, we know a lot more than that. We know the entire uh, velocity distribution, and uh, page two of uh, Bini and Germain has this Eddington inversion formula, which allows one to actually work out the entire velocity distribution function. So that's not just the second moment, but the entire velocity distribution function, which we can again uh, predict uh, from, the, uh, from the simulations, uh, and then uh, see how well the predicted stellar uh, velocity distribution uh, matches the data uh, split into four bits of radius. So this is the inner parts, uh, intermediate and outer parts. So it's the entire velocity distribution function, and uh, in the case of, uh, uh, of uh, zero isotropy, <coughs> And you can see that, in fact, uh, the data is really well. So this is a consistency check that uh, the isotropic assumption is good. So the uh, conclusion of this work, in the case of Fornax, is that the photometric and kinematic data for the satellites are consistent with the Kosky NFW uh, profiles. It doesn't prove that they have it. Uh, it just uh, means that the data is consistent. With that, there could be other solutions that also fit. 
So the Kolsky profiles are perfectly uh, reasonable fit to all the data, everything we know about the satellites. But very quickly, I just want to uh, mention, touch on another of these uh, areas, of course, we will talk to us about CDM, and that is the uh, number of satellites. Now, many of you here in this audience will be familiar with this uh, so called satellite problem. I love the satellite problem because it reminds me of Ibsen, the great uh, Danish uh, uh, playwright who wrote this uh, 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 play. That was the uh, <laughs> origin, sorry. Uh, they're all the same. <laughs> He wrote this great, great uh, play, uh, Seven Actors in uh, Search of an Author. And uh, here's the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, all right, so, uh, here's the problem. The problem is that the simulation that I want to solve uh, 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 <laughs> can make lots of small halos where, as we can see, the Milky Way only has a handful of Santa. And that's all the uh, satellite problem, and the reason I love this problem is because the solution came before the problem. Uh, the problem was, post was uh, formulated around 1999. The solution was already there uh, in 1993 in this paper by Kaufman et al., where they were using some analytic techniques to model the fact the local group as part of uh, another bigger study. But they noticed that uh, uh, unless they did something uh, special, there would be uh, a large number of satellites that we formed, and they were already here propose the idea that uh, there would be a mechanism perhaps to suppress the formation of dwarfs. Uh, they were not very specific about what that mechanism <coughs> would be, but the word ionization is actually uh, mentioned there. Now, these uh, processes were calculated more carefully and in more detail in an Benson species. So, here's a plot that shows number uh, as a function of magnitude, uh, as a velocity function. Here are uh, the number dark matter halos, there are lots of them, but when you try to study galaxies you measure in them uh, and take account of various feedback processes, uh, you find, for example, that your supernova feedback already makes it very difficult, impossible, in fact, to form a galaxy successfully in many of these small halos. So uh, supernova feedback suppresses the formation of galaxies by a large factor, uh, and then uh, reionization finishes the job. And uh, in fact, uh, when we uh, open this paper, uh, some people noticed that uh, our best model from the blue was not very good because it predicted the presence of many satellites that were not known. Uh, at the time, this was 1993, when only 11 satellites were known. And of course, uh, the year after the paper was published, uh, many more satellites were discovered. This was known in the Milky Way. And uh, here's where the new data come out, exactly where uh, Benson got predicted they should be. Now, I often say it's one of those great examples. Oops. Uh, where, uh, where there was CDM prediction in advance of the observations, but I don't really mean it. Uh, I think this is one of those cases where there's 80% uh, inspiration, 20% inspiration, 80% good luck. I think we just got lucky uh, with uh, all real uncertain physics, but um, well, there we are. So, one can repeat that now with more modern simulations. Here is uh, the same kind of work, not only the Aquarius halo, and the same good agreement with the data. Now, you can do uh, simulations as well, SPA simulations, less resolution of the same Aquarius halos, and the answer is the same. So, in my remaining one minute, though, uh, I want to uh, move on to the last topic to summarize what I said so far. Uh, there are only a few of these halos so made the galaxy because of realization and feedback. So, I just want to spend maybe one minute talking about uh, something that is very exciting and how we can look at. Uh, uh, the uh, after <coughs> map of hierarchical formation by looking uh, at stars in the halo of the Milky Way. So, uh, you're all familiar, or many of you will be, with this field of streams, the fact that the halo of the Milky Way has these streams, Sagittarius, uh, some people the orphan stream, the Morosal stream. <coughs> and uh, this, uh, I uh, see the end right, should be the remnants of what we saw in that movie, uh, this tiny stripping, uh, in this case, of stars. Uh, one of the sessions two days ago was a beautiful picture of the Panda survey uh, uh, that uh, uh, Larry Withrow showed. And the question is, uh, can we see that kind of phenomenon going on in the simulation? Well, the answer is, of course, this is dark matter. We can put stars in the simulations, which one can do, for example, using some analytic techniques. And uh, here, then, is uh, uh, the picture in stars, some of these halos, today, the six halos. And it's instructive just to do a beauty contest. 
Uh, and here's the Panda survey from uh, one. And here is one of the simulations that we made in the space and color scheme. So we could uh, influence your opinion. But so what? We actually do see several of the same type of structures. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think uh, F33 ended up on the wrong side. But other than that, you see the shells and all this general debris that we can see in the real data. Uh, here are uh, some images of real galaxies by Martinez Delgado et al. And you see the shells and uh, sort of seeming jets and things like that. And uh, here are uh, stellar images from the Apollo simulations made by Andrew Cooper. Uh, one is tempted to compare those two. Uh, but here's one of my favorite ones. Um, Sorry, this one is one of my favorite ones. You can compare this one to that one. See, this one has two jets. Uh, this one has two jets. You see that? There it is. And uh, but the absolute favorite one is this one. Uh, here you see the simulation, uh, and here you see the <coughs> galaxy. So let me then just uh, conclude uh, by saying that uh, I think the uh, uh, Milky Way, uh, we know learning more and more about the Milky Way. And um, it looks as though it will, in fact, be a very fruitful avenue for the uh, test uh, <coughs> validity of CDM. And eventually, of course, the future looks very uh, promising. The subject, fast stars, and Gaia will make enormous progress in our understanding of the way and will allow all these um, ideas that I've been talking about today to be put on a firmer foot. But of course, the only proof of all that life will be to find it. And, uh, I hope that uh, will happen in the next few years, a number of uh, possibilities for discovering the dark matter. And I sometimes say it's a little bit like uh, it must have been in the 1950s before the discovery of the double helix. It's sort of in the air that the CDM is about to be discovered. So uh, the golden era in cosmology is not over by any means. Uh, here is uh, born the brilliant primer. And uh, I don't know what we really has in mind, but uh, and it's called the Billion X Vinegar, and, uh, uh, and we want to finish off uh, by wishing Dick a happy birthday and uh, many more like this. So that's a very interesting observation. So, so John is referring to the fact that uh, uh, it appears as though the satellites of the Milky Way uh, all have pretty much the same central density, uh, the mass within 300 parsecs, uh, within a factor of two or three, even though they span five orders of magnitude in the velocity. So that seems to suggest that maybe there's a preferred scale in uh, the problem, uh, and uh, maybe some people have argued that that may be a signature of one that matter. But in fact, it turns out that in this uh, sort of uh, treatment, there's also a preferred scale, which is the fact that the gap of realization is one scale, uh, because of the cooling curve is another, and uh, because of the presence of the scale, when we go through the calculations, like a plot slide will show you, in fact, it turns out that uh, the mass between 300 parsecs in the simulations is also pretty much constant. It's not exactly constant. There's a small trend of uh, uh, increasing with uh, luminosity, which in principle should be testable. But uh, to first order, that seems to come out because of these natural thresholds in, um, in, in star formation. That's it. In terms of direct detection on Earth, how substantial could the fluctuations be in uh, well, it turns out that uh, all this activity that we saw going on in the simulation uh, at any time is extremely efficient at uh, essentially annihilating anything near the solar uh, neighborhood. And uh, we've written a couple of papers with the Aquarius simulation, and Simon and uh, Mark Wolkensberg have written a couple more, where I think we show quite persuasively, in fact, that uh, the fluctuations are very, very small. So uh, I think. The uh, uh, possibility that some people have spoken about that maybe we live in a fractal and that uh, we could be large fluctuations in the dark matter density at the position of the sun. I think they're not uh, substantiated by the simulations. And so, for the simulation levels, although of course there's still many orders of magnitude from resolving uh, an experiment in the laboratory in the simulation, I think what they tell us is that we should expect a very, very smooth uh, distribution of dark matter locally 
and the velocity distribution, which is close to uh, it's a multivariate Gaussian. So it's not a Gaussian as many simple models assume. It's a multivariate Gaussian with different dispersions in different directions. Okay, I think we'll have to stop there. Remember, there's a photograph outside on the <coughs> steps, and we can't have your lunch until the photograph is <laughs> Well, we've seen this morning that it's compulsory to start your talk with a picture of yourself in Berkeley in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know my secret, I lie about my age. <laughs> I wasn't in Berkeley in 1980. Am I sad? Well, it was obviously an interesting time. But supposing you had been there and you failed to do world shattering work, you could recover. So, on the whole, perhaps it was best not to take the risk. So, so for me, Berkeley in 1980 was, was actually CETA. I first met Dick, I think, at uh, pre guy in 1982. It was at CETA I first really got to know him. My first visit was 1988. And that was brokered by, um, Nick, uh, by Dick's partner in crime. Now, and I know I'm not the only one who's, who's very sad that Nick can't be here today. Because, because I think CETA for me was very much the, uh, the Dick and Nick show. And it was a great time. It really rose almost from nowhere of the world centre of cosmology overnight. They had help, of course, and we had some very nice reminiscences yesterday about, about Paul Lev. I'm proud to say, I hope I'm not wrong, that Lev's first trip to, to the West was actually to Edinburgh, which was by virtue of Martin Locker and good connections with Soviet groups. So I remember he, he get to the airport, took a taxi straight to my flat, appeared on the door and introduced each, each other. And I then had to explain to him why the taxi driver had called him Jimmy rather than Lev. <laughs> he seemed very confused. <laughs> so, so these were great times. But because they were good people, coming to see you was stimulating, but hard to live up to. So you might as well have entitled this talk how, how I tried and failed largely, but not entirely. So, a brief outline is, when I was writing it, I was horrified to realize it actually covers cosmology in four distinct decades. So, you better solve things quickly because there aren't any left. And in the 1980s, talk about mystery density peaks, how that transmogrified the halos, the Schechter and all that in the 1990s, its apotheosis to the halo model in the last decade, and um, various applications to different kinds of gamma today. So this is the book that launched a thousand papers. Um, a number of us in the, in the middle of the 1980s were lucky enough to discover this, this track, a particular marvelous article by, by Rice. And it's amazing to look back and think how ignorant we were then by today's standards. I mean, the density field is just a, a random process. And there was lots of mathematics well understood about these things, it's just most of the models didn't know about it. So I think Nick was the first to stumble across this, and uh, independently, not long afterwards, I found it in the Royal Observatory Library. And as we know, Nick used kind of mathematical tools that Rice had pioneered to figure out the, the puzzle, the solution to the puzzle, of why a bell clusters had an Alice cluster. Just that unusually high regions in the randomness of the field are unusually strongly correlated. And this paper is cited and cited and cited as having started galaxy bias. Of course, it didn't at all. The physics think did would apply perfectly if light traced mass exactly. So, what, what I wanted to do with this, I was motivated by having worked on abundances of high redshift quasars. So, I wanted to do with distributions of flap stars, which, of course, you can calculate if you know the distributions of heights of peaks in the gas and density field. So, Al and I got together and we we wrote a paper on this in 1985, and we calculated the peak height distribution. It looks a bit ratty, and that's because we did a, a six-dimensional Monte Carlo integration, which for the computers at that time was probably quite a cheesy. And then the Bible came out, and to my, to my horror, I found that the um, BBKS could, could do five out of the six uh, integrals analytically. I suppose I was, I was quite pleased that it wasn't six out of six. <laughs> It's, it's, it's clear that the occurs for a lot 
um, that I'll like to move on that. What this paper also did, as, as, um, as Carlos uh, alluded to, was interesting set cosmology back a decade ago, <laughs> putting us on, the, on, on the, the world goose chase of trying to reconcile Einstein and Sidney with, um, with the data by, by having a high threshold for galaxy formation. That, that, that's unfair, of course, because I think our confidence in the low density model wouldn't be so extreme if we have to try and try and try to make Einstein's a sitter work and ultimately fail. So this was a necessary part that we had to go through. So it's kind of interesting historically, given that the 1980s were full of all these pictures of density peaks, but all that stuff has, has really faded from the, from the forefront of the subject, which now goes back in a sense to a, a more old-fashioned approach, which is which the one pioneered by Crescetta, that is just looking at points in, in, in density, or rather points average of a sphere or something like this, and asking if a sphere is sufficient evidence, it will collapse when you form an object a halo. So there was a long standing problem with that, which was there was a cloud in cloud in the Crescetta analysis, they counted for half the mass, the other half was under dense, and where did it go? Well, Alan and I wrote another paper in 1990 where, where we, we realized that you could look at different smoothness scales simultaneously. So if this is the, the density contrast as a function of smoothing scale, you might have a point that was um, on some <coughs> small smoothing scale below the threshold, but nevertheless above the threshold on a larger scale. So it wasn't under dense in a low mass object, it was actually in a big one all along. And by analyzing this trajectory, we could get a prediction of the mass function, which was less peaking than the pressure, that's the dotted line. And it's, it's probably just a complete coincidence, but that less peaking form is more like what comes out of the analog simulations now. So we were happy for a little while, and then again, along came the juggernaut, who not only did all this in a great deal more detail, but also did the thing that we missed, which is that that trajectory gives you not only mass function, but you do the conditional mass function. So the parts of the mass is going to be here. And of course, this is the central thing of our understanding of, of galaxy formation today. Uh, Carlos is sitting there busily counting his citations, and they're all based on, on semi-analytics, basically following the merger trees that, that all this stuff can be part of. So the, um, another application the clustering of the payloads. And the, the, uh, the term that's really cares to brief to us, one of the many, is the peak background split. Uh, the, the overall density field is the, the high frequency terms, which are the galaxy scale objects, and some low frequency wash. <laughs> <laughs> so, this, so this was all articulated in, in 86 from the point of view of clustering of peaks. And it's very strange, given such good work on, on halo mass functions, that it took until 1999 for somebody to just say, look, actually, the way to look at the peak background split is that it simply modulates the pressure of the star mass function. And in particular, if you believe the mass function n of n is of some form which is not pressure, what you have to do is just differentiate it as by, by thinking of the large scale density field as changing with the threshold for collapse, differentiate the mass function, whatever its function of form is, you think of its end-body data with respect to that threshold. And you deduce automatically a bias parameter. So, Chef and Tom told us how you could close this and, and read off how halos have to be biased just by knowing how many of them are. But even before we got that, Bias was a, a useful thing, even empirically, once you knew that different categories of galaxies would have different bias. Um, and this came together in the whole effort of understanding what code was telling us. So, uh, as soon as the code results came out, I started thinking, hmm, I should write a paper on what this means for large scale structure. Um, and in about 30 seconds, this, this one by George like, Dick and Simon came out. So in fact, I didn't get my act together until two years later. Um, now what they've done is introduced the infamous gamma parameter. If you're counting, there'll be three gammas in this talk, and they're not all the same. Um, this one is the, the thing that dictates where the break in the primordial mass spectrum was. 
that's the amount of times h. And what I claimed at the time was that this number was about 0.25. By modern terms, we look at this set of uh, d highest um, linearized traces, we see that the problem with this is one was really going too far to the right. It's too non-linear here to, to correct that easily. So the right answer was a bit lower. So we got the, the 2bf, just a hair under 0.2. And it's, it's amazing to see the rapid pace of progress from these really junky measurements that we had in the 1990s. Um, well, that I had. The APR was better. Uh, to, so the error bars in the 2DF were so small that you could barely see them. But you could just see the barium wrinkles, which, which I think were there even you know, very clearly even our first results in 2001. Although, again, talking about missing print seems to be a recurring theme. We didn't think then the idea of using it as a, as a standard ruler in the It's now become a big industry. So, all these ingredients have come together in a, in a model which has which now seen a lot of use. And, and again, you, you wonder why it took so long, because all the, the bits that we needed were actually there long ago, even before I was born. Um, this, this just goes back to the idea that cluster, what does clustering mean? It's excess pairs of neighbors. So if you imagine all galaxies live in some lumps, as, as Neyman and friends did, and of course you have clustering, just <coughs> virtue of the sizes of the lumps. So clustering tells you in their view something about, about the internal structure. And all we needed to be doing was generalizing that, the, the kinds of lumps around an empty simulation to the CD in the universe, the halos that the car shows. So that's fine for the mass, to apply that to galaxies, you need to convert the dark matter halos into the galaxy population. Um, Pallas didn't claim that as a solved problem. That's fine, we actually have to carry on working after these six right? But the nice thing is that we know that's what you need to know. So just put on the box there and we'll be happy with this video of last year. It's a known one. And it's one you can address empirically as well, figuring out the galaxy contents. The dark matter here is just that's the final galaxy group. <coughs> So this is a, a halo model view of, of the power spectrum the universe then, linear theory. <coughs> this is d variance by the log k, so that's the kq p of k, some people's units. Linear theory, and the additional one halo terms from halos of various masses, from very low to very high. So obviously now you can, you can weight those halos with different galaxy contents and we get a biased galaxy view of whatever kind you like. And there's the thing, this worked. And this is the trick. You know, the, the biggest trick out of 2 the this, which we could have probably done, was spotting this transition between the cluster and data. So it's a hard data for us to do this. You can really see the inflection as you go from large scales, which is more linear theory, to small scales, where a single halo comes in. So from this you can read off the mass of the halos that the galaxies reside in. It's, it's all really a, <coughs> empirically a very well understood problem. And it's a useful way of approaching it as, as well. As, as we'll see, one of the things that increasingly everyone needs to do in this subject is to make fake universes so you can see what your survey will actually have got. And, 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 and that's very time piecing. But the halo model it doesn't need to be. So, you have to spend a lot of time running a very large box. These days you need a multi gigabyte Excel inside the simulation volumes. You can run actually a very poor solution simulation. You use the knowledge of conditional mass function to populate a given cell with halos. And you have some galaxy statistics, some knowledge of the occupation, which you can either put in as an empirical recipe or you can look up in some small volume where someone's done a detailed. Information calculation, like the millennium simulation, <coughs> and you can immediately have a semi realistic galaxy distribution through these vast volumes. This is a very practical approach. It's not perfect. Um, you will hear a lot of criticism about a thing called formation, in the formation bias, um, which some people would have you believe came out of the sky as a great shock, completely 
destroys the, uh, the virtues of the, the Hiller model approach. Basically, what it says is that Hiller's a given mass, the ones that fall the earliest are the strongest cluster. Now, the whole one that I, that I heard people worrying about this, because this is already exactly what Nick was saying in, in 2004. That's the whole point about why high peak bias works. The highest, rarest peaks are the worst clusters. Of course, if there's a spread of formation here with a spread of objects of a given mass, you expect to have a range of clusters. So what you need to compute is the mean cluster of uh, the number of objects of that mass, and that's what the Halo model uses. So the reason there's a potential problem is, is at the next level down, that if you want to use this to predict galaxies, you have to say, now that I expect that the galaxy population is the Halo of a given mass that forms early, as this is one of the same mass that forms late, will be the same. Well, of course not identically the stars of age, but it's nothing to do with the dark matter side of it. It's purely a application of physics. And I think this was all said at the beginning here. So, if you're optimistic, and, and why not, um, especially as time is running out, but it's just talking out of life, you um, <laughs> don't have to regard your structure as a, as a solved problem, more or less. So it's, it's coming from a, a great puzzle or something we just don't have the faintest idea about what it's telling us, to, to a tool. And this tool is, is really devoted to, to studying the large-scale ducts. And you, you'll know this argument that the only evidence we really have strongly for the existence of dark energy is that when we apply the field equation to the data, we seem to need an extra term to describe the expansion history of the universe. Right? So that extra term is plausibly a homogeneous contribution to the energy density of the universe, or maybe it just says the Friedman equation wasn't right in the first place, and this extra term indicates the need for a new theory of gravity. You can't split those, those possibilities just with observations of supernova holodar elements. So what you need is, is to look at the next level down at the operation of gravity on in, in homogeneities. And basically, the uh, thing that the field is, is fastened on is to realize that galaxy surveys measure delta, the fractional fluctuation in the light density, and ideally in the mass density, and the logarithmic growth rate of that with respect to scale factor. As a standard form, which goes back to Jim Peebles, the density parameter to, for the gamma power, like gamma used to be 0.6, but now in a, a great leap forward, it's now 0.55. So you know that, look forward to the future. See how many things where the next decimal place is printed on. So A is R. A is the scale factor, the dimensional scale factor. Sorry? A is the same as R. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. No, R is the dimensional full scale factor. And A is, is R divided by R naught. <laughs> <laughs> The difference is moot for a flat universe, right? But for a curved one, you would only want this coordinate to be like an angle, in which case this one is the curvature of your radius. It's just a image, but it's my indulgent. Um, <clears throat> so omega changes with time, and as it changes, the growth rate of density fluctuations are altered. What people have realized is that this recipe can capture, if not all, but a lot of the modified gravity models that people talk about. So, from a phenomenological point of view, this is great. You don't need to, to know too much about the Grangians. You just need to be able to measure gap. If it's not 0.55, you get in the human stop. So, this is what people are trying to do. Well, there's, there's two aspects to this. One, you've got to try and characterize this, this phenomenological term, whether it's a physical fluid or something else, it's still has an equation of state W. You may as well measure that. And at the same time, <coughs> measure the growth. So the geometrical means, the large scale structure, if you try to measure W, comes from using the barrier oscillation as a, as a standard ruler. And now, the data are so good, we don't even bother showing the, the overall large scale form of the power spectrum anymore. We divide that out, <coughs> and you can pick out the, the barrier oscillations. So here, you see results at Richard 0.2, 0.35, the principal peak is in the same place. It's in the same place 
the civil standard of the of geometry. Change that geometry and the alignment will be a bit poor, and that's how you constrain effectively the distance ratio relation. And the kind of target that people have is to do better than literature numbers that you already find, which is to say that W is consistent with minus <coughs> one, that is equivalent to a constant of about five percent. To get even that far, you need to measure the location of this peak to about one percent precision. And to go better than that, therefore, um, you need to do a rule of thumb arguments to show that you need Richard surveys of many millions of mechanics. So that's a, a motivation for new next generation projects like the BOSS survey. So, so, um, <coughs> so that's W, that's the that's geometric approach to, to try to characterize the the large scale home units. The growth rate, what's emerged is that the register space distortions of the analog system have become very much the favorite tool for trying to figure out how fast density fluctuations are growing and what that tells us about gravity. So let's just to say a little bit about, about this, because these, these two things are coupled. So, first of all, let's, let's talk about the, um, the barrier ring, which uh, you can see either a projection. Or radially should be circular, but of course it's only circular if you know how to convert angles and rigid differences to distances, which again requires, requires the expansion. So if you get that wrong, you'll get what's called the arc of Pichinsky distortion, that is the burying circle that has an ellipse of some kind. So that's one thing we have to worry about when we're, when we're measuring these things in rigid space. Here's the best picture I know of the results from this. This is not the main Sloan sample, it's the Sloan um, LRGs. So it's, you see the barium ring, which looks pretty circular, which is good, so the cosmological geometry is not too far out. But you also see this stuff in here, which is much more flattened. And that, of course, is the, the retrospective space distortions that um, the Kaiser worked on in the 80s. And this we measured pretty precisely for this day with, with, with 2 here. Let's just remind ourselves what we're looking at. You are here, you have a pair of galaxies here with some peculiar velocities. Those peculiar velocities mess up where you think those galaxies are located. Radial transfer separation doesn't change, the radial does. So what should be contoured as circular contours of correlation, therefore get flattened on large scales, like the here did before, and stretched down on small scales by Virilized motions and side waves. And you can model that, and the model contours that fit the 2 the data pretty well. And just to emphasize a bit more what we're looking at, it's just a few charts of these, these nice mocks that the thermal group made of uh, a real space down to distribution and richer space. So you, see, you can see the fingers of God stretching out clusters. And you can see the large scale coherent velocity field that's, uh, that's moving things around a bit. <coughs> so, we're trying to use that <coughs> large scale flattening to, to measure the inform rate because a large scale flattening is caused by peculiar velocities, peculiar velocities by the continuity of the depending on, on the growth rate of the density fluctuations. So, what do you measure? There's a number called beta in the trade, which is a thing you'd like to, to know, the growth rate of density perturbations, divided by the bias parameter for that set of galaxies. So a lot of the discussions that you'll, you'll read about this just kind of assume that B can be obtained somehow. You know, don't know the dark alley, no questions asked, cash for the first customer. Um, it's not so clear how you're going to do this. So maybe using the bias spectrum, but whether you model some sort of nonlinear process like that effectively is a, is a bit of a concern. So I think one would rather say you'd better read off the current bias parameter to say we know the fluctuations in the galaxies of the galaxy traces. If we have cosmological parameters, we know from the CMB what the matter fluctuations must be. So the bias parameter is, is determined. And the problem is that we have the alpha Kaczynski distortion, that is, we don't measure directly. 
secondary, the true secondary galaxy, we measure a parallel one for some scene geometry. So what, all that has to be has to be folded in, otherwise you can just leave the accurate answer. And the sort of picture you end up with is that the fact that richer space distortions give, give you, as usual, the last year, the kind of degeneracy. So gamma, if you remember, is the index that governs the, the rate of growth of the regions. The value you infer the gamma depends on the value you assume for the effective equation state of dark energy. So the standard model is here, minus 1, 1.55, that's red space distortion data just gives you something along this line. So if you know you're off that line, then um, you might be tempted to say, Einstein was wrong, given me, me my prize. But you might actually just have learned that the W wasn't minus 1. And we have to be careful here. There was an infamous paper which went through several versions which by Rachel Bean, claiming that apparently standard gravity did not fit a set of the last year later. She assumed W equals minus 1. And so that, that's, that's something that I think one must not do. So Davis Simpson and I wrote a paper on this recently where we actually tried to figure out precisely how well correlated these, these parameters would be. And that's yeah, the computer generated cartoon compared to the hand generated one of the previous survey. So I think when one, when one's approaching this empirically, there's a lot of talk about figures of merit. Um, and these tend to concentrate almost entirely on how well you can measure dark energy at uh, W. But really, dark energy and deviations from Einstein gravity should be viewed as having been on equal footing. And you want to see if there's anything on standard on which it is. It is. So you really should be looking at something like the area of confidence ellipses on that kind of thing. All right, so we're trying to measure these things very accurately in the future. And one day, and I hope it doesn't take as long as Planck, we might have Euclid to, to, to do this for us. But of course, it might not work. Um, we're just assuming that Rutan will carry on working forever. We get more galaxies. And measure things like richer space distortions more precisely. <coughs> but we'd like to be able to prove that we do recover something about the dark matter distribution rather than about the peculiarities of galaxy formation. So, this um, is one thing we're trying to pursue. I spent a couple of minutes talking about where the UK and Australia have tried to go after the peculiarities of the project. And that's a thing called gamma, whose aim is basically to get about the same number of redshift as 200,000 but much deeper, basically, because the instrument is being upgraded. So we're aiming to go to an RF of 19.8, so two full magnitudes equal to the SDS domain so on. Now, there's the team. And the first to pick out is the overall PI is Simon Driver, as you know. This has been going for two observing seasons now. We've got already over 100,000 redshifts, concentrating in, uh, in three fields on the equator, nine hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, which uh, are <coughs> four by 12 and a half degrees. And that's the, the current distribution. So this is, um, the yellow stuff here is, is, is 2DF, and you can see just how much beautiful extra data you get by getting the two, <coughs> the two magnitudes fainter. We also learned a lot about local dwarfs, which is another motivation for gamma, but that's, that's not for today. So, one thing that's been worked on right now is retro space distortions and that, which we already did with GBF as a function of the um, galaxy type, so red galaxies and blue. And of course, you see with the bias parameters and the different kinds of halos, the different lots of dispersions that are occupied, you come up with very different patterns. Um, the gamma results look pretty similar, but that's because I'm going to go from a maximum distance of 30 megaparsecs to 60. So things have really, really moved up a step. And if you compare simple models for the data, it all looks pretty good. I'm not going to give you the final number yet for how long well this works, but I, I think this is, this is something to watch out for. The Gamma survey will definitely tell us whether we can get a consistent answer about the growth rate of density fluctuations out of galaxy surveys. Now, independent of galaxy type. And that's, I think that's an important scientific check on this whole thing. So, I'm done. Um, Dick has, has left us a great legacy. 
and Glasgow structure. Thanks very much to him is, is in good shape and is going to be doing good things in the future. I just want to close by, by one note of criticism. Um, you know, Dick, you, I always thought you lacked foresight. So, so 60 years ago, you really should have thought to be born in February. Because then we'd have had this meeting somewhere where the other kind of dark matter is um, very much in evidence. And I've enjoyed very much the interactions with Dick on the slopes. And I hope for many more to come. Thank you. <laughs>